One of, of the most critical challenge that we are going to face in the next decades is aging, aging of the population. I think that most of you have experienced that elderly, that aging can affect our movement ability and capability to live autonomously. Think about um, stroke patients, lower limb amputees, or more simply, the physiological decline of your biomechanics. Why aging is such a big challenge? I think there are mostly two reasons. One is in our personal domain. I think that it's desirable that we can live our life going around, enjoying, until the last day of life. Without the burden of our body becoming more and more fragile. The second reason is in our society. Look at this number. In about 40 years from now, 35% of the population will be older than 65. This means that there will be an increasing number of persons requiring assistance and a decreasing number of persons that can provide assistance. Guys, there is a strong need for mobility. We need machines that can help us to age while remaining creative, active, and happy. My dream is to develop exoskeletons, robotic exoskeletons, that can promote the establishment of a sustainable progress by means of what we call human exoskeleton symbiosis. The symbiosis between a machine and a human is something that is not new. About 50 years ago, Joseph Licklider, the father of internet, talked about the symbiosis between human and computing machines. I think that nowadays, this is a reality. You have your smartphone, you cannot live without it. Unfortunately, an, a symbiosis between an exoskeleton and a person is not that much easy. With your smartphone, you just exchange information. With a robot like the one I'm wearing, you have to exchange mechanical power. We humans are very good in being elastic, we are flexible, we are adaptive, we are intelligent, but we are all of us different among us. Our body size, our body shape, our behavior. On the other side of the story, robots are very strong, are very stiff, are easy to set up, are fast, but robots are still encumbered, heavy, bulky. So putting a human and a robot together is not an easy task. Despite what you see in the science fiction, like, I don't know, movies like Elysium, just to mention the last one, or Iron Man. Guys, that's science fiction. Reality is a completely different story. At the Biorobotics Institute of Scuola Santana, where I have my lab, we started working on exoskeletons about 10 years ago. This is the first example I want to show you. This is an exoskeleton for the elbow that was thought to be used in clinics, so to help physical therapists to make rehabilitation after stroke. After a stroke, a person can have his, his or her elbow spastic, so they need mobilization. This machine can help the therapist to provide intensive treatment and improve the mobility. In 10 years, 10 years, we managed to make the device and make early tests, and still does a lot to do. Of course, you can continue your dream and say, okay, this is the elbow, but I want to do also the shoulder. The shoulder joint in human, the one that you use every day, is something extremely complex. I say to my students, it's a piece of artwork of nature. 
You can make rotations, but you also have translations. So making a robot that couples perfect with the show that is really demanding. We are still working on it. Of course, I told you that exoskeletons can be a solution for mobility. So you want wearable robots coming outside the lab, outside the clinic. And this is what we tried with an L, with the hand exoskeleton. Actually, there are patients like affected by spinal cord injury, so partial lesion. These people, sometimes they stay on a wheelchair. They can move the arm, but they cannot use the hand. So you move your arm, but no grasping ability. You cannot drink alone. You cannot eat alone. You cannot do anything. You need. 100% of your time supports from somebody else. Then we developed a robot. We tried to connect it with the brain, by means what we call brain to machine interface. So by means of electrodes on the scalp, on the side of your face by actually detecting the eye movements. We are able to understand when you want to open and want to close the hand. People like the one you see in this video, can think about to close the hand. The exoskeleton is able to do this. And by this simple paradigm, these people were able to, I don't know, eat again, or to make a signature, or to use a, the credit card, something that I would say is very common and easy for everybody. Let me come to the last example which is about lower limb amputation. Lower limb transfemoral amputation, so above knee prosthesis, just to be more pragmatic. Walking with a prosthesis is incredibly tiring. Think about, these people usually walk at 40% of the velocity that you walk, and they consume 2.5 times the same energy. You would never like a car that has this kind of performance. And these people, they don't use the prosthesis. Indeed, they prefer the wheelchair. And this is the majority of lower limb amputees. And then we came with the idea, with the dream. We want to help these people. And then you can develop devices like the one I'm wearing that can actually inject energy into the gait and making the gait pattern more efficient. If you are asking, how this machine works, it's extremely simple in a sense. There is an actuator right here that has the same functional, I would say, is inspired to our muscle. So there's some elasticity there. So you can basically couple the human with an elastic machine. And then when you start working, the device actually gets synchronized with your movement. There's a kind of controller similar to the pacemaker in our brain and then provide assistance in a very gentle and effective way. Let me conclude. I think that you are now aware more of the potentialities of the wearable robotics, of the exoskeletons. But I hope that you are also aware that there's still a lot of work to do. And that's the reason why we as a community need to gain momentum and keep the gradient of the challenge. Thank you.